delighted to be here and talk about the, my most favorite subject, which is water and, and public health. And it's really exciting uh, to be able to present this across uh, many different uh, venues here. And um, per our discussions I've had with moderators, we'll hold questions till the end and then try to answer as many questions as you might have about what I think is a very relevant topic. A little bit about uh, me, I am, as you heard, an environmental microbiologist and an environmental engineer. And what that means is I bridge many different disciplines and I look at questions of things in the environment, like organisms, chemicals, and how they affect public health, and then apply engineering principles and practices to try to uh, see what we can do to, to change some of the challenges that are facing our population. Um, a little bit of background on my uh, how I got to be here at Hopkins. And let's see, I did a master's and PhD in environmental sciences and engineering at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill School of Public Health. And uh, there's where I learned at the time, this was uh, many decades ago, uh, advanced tools and techniques that are still used today, like polymerase chain reaction for detecting microorganisms. I then did a postdoctoral fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine in molecular virology in Houston, Texas, where I did a lot of clinical research on what is my favorite microorganism, norovirus. It's commonly known as the cruise ship virus in there. So uh, this combined um, schooling, so after I finished my um, high school, I did an additional 14 years of training and education to get to where I am now. And I came to Johns Hopkins in 1999 as an assistant professor, and I've been here ever since. And as you heard, I'm director of the Hopkins Water Institute, and I have two main areas of research in my own laboratory, which you're gonna hear about. Part of it, we'll talk about what we call high-income countries and use examples in the United States, focusing on water. And I also work on water reuse, a uh, big challenge that we have across the world is climate change. I'll try to integrate a little bit of that in there. And the other part of my research involves water, sanitation and hygiene called WASH. And this is mostly in low income and middle income countries, focusing on women empowerment and linking menstrual health and hygiene with sanitation as drivers of change. And we'll talk about that as well. So the last couple of years has been a little challenging for all of us as we uh, exit the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. My research actually was directly involved with assisting in, in developing approaches during the uh, COVID pandemic. And for the past two years, I've worked also on what's called wastewater epidemiology, where we looked at the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. This is the virus that causes COVID. And we looked for it in sewage. And the idea there is it can be a marker for what's going on uh, health-wise is that people, when they defecate, they can actually um, uh, deposit some of these viruses in the sewage and we can monitor the sewage to see how many people might be sick with um, uh, SARS coronavirus too. And we did that for the student dorms at Johns Hopkins University. And at the same time, when across the world, people started sheltering at home, not traveling as much, a lot of the buildings stopped being used at the same intensity, meaning there was less people in buildings. That caused our drinking water inside the buildings to stagnate. And when you have stagnant water in buildings, then they were never designed to just not uh, transfer the water throughout the, the building. You can have things deposited into the water. Lead is one of the ones that can leach out. We'll talk briefly about that. We've also talked about the drinking water pipes could build up um, uh, biofilms. And so some of these can cause microorganisms. We'll briefly mention that. And at the same time, I worked um, across with many colleagues in the Navajo Nation with the Dine population there during the COVID crisis on improving water access. So I'm gonna start off with actually a question. And this is about a cool sip of water. I'd like each of you to think for a moment, is the tap water safe to drink where you are right now? And so this might vary in your answers, depending on where you're located, both in high income countries like the US or around other parts of the world. You might say, mm, yes, it's fine, or perhaps no. And the next question I'm gonna ask you is, did you brush your teeth today? And hopefully every one of you is saying yes, that's part of my public health thing is, did you brush your teeth? And the question I have on this is, what water did you use to brush your teeth? 
Now, many individuals in high income countries like the United States and in Europe will say, oh, I drink, I drink bottled water, but then they will also say, oh, when I brush my teeth, when I shower, I use tap water, and they don't even think about it. And so part of that disconnect we have in many parts of the world is the value of water. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And then I ask people, you know, how much did you pay for the last bottle of water? And sometimes bottles of water can be very expensive, $2 or $3. If you go to an event, sometimes it can be even more than that. So it can be quite expensive. So bottled water has the challenges. And then do you pay for that drink from the water fountain? Again, in high income countries like the US, uh, usually you can drink the water without having to pay for it. And then have you ever thrown a bottle of water away? Yeah, we've all thrown bottles of water away. There's plastic waste that's, that's significant. And then kind of just tongue in cheek, have you ever thrown a sink away? You know, individuals that might be renovating a home, you might've been in a home in there, might do. For the most part, we take care of what's called our infrastructure. You know, you don't just waste a, a sink or throw them away. And I'm gonna tell you what I absolutely love. I love indoor plumbing. It's the most amazing thing in the world. In the United States and other high income countries, you can go to any major city, go to the library and take a long cool drink from a water fountain and be reasonably assured that you're not going to die in two days. Now, what do I mean by that? By the reasonable part is even in high income countries, we might have to take care of our water for short periods of time. We'll talk about this a little about it's called boil water notices, where sometimes for just a short period of time, you might actually have to do something to your water instead of drink it right when it comes out of the tap. But for the most part, we get that water all the time. It's called potable, meaning drinking water. And then death. In high income countries, we've taken away most of the microbial burden from our drinking water, cholera, typhoid, that kills and still continues to kill around the world many, many people. So in the United States and other high income countries, you're reasonably sure that you're not going to die when you drink tap water. In the middle of the night, you can wake up, take a few steps and urinate and defecate, Whoosh, flush the toilet. Out of sight, out of mind, it's truly amazing. And most of us in high income countries take this completely for granted. And that's part of the challenge. So we're gonna talk about some of the opportunities and challenges in high income countries, and then for the last part of the talk, we're going to talk about what's going on in low and middle income countries. So one of the reasons why we in high income countries can be reasonably sure that we're not going to die in a couple of days when we drink the water, meaning the potable water from our taps, is this single individual, able woman. Now, able woman graduated from my university, Johns Hopkins University, Arts and Sciences in 1913. He then did a master's degree in 1915 from Hopkins. He's a world-renowned water treatment expert whose career in civil engineering and public health spans 70 years, most of that at Johns Hopkins. As an engineer, he came to the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and started what is now my department. Freshmen that enter Johns Hopkins University stay at the Woolman Hall. If you pay your water bill at Baltimore, you pay it at the Abel Woolman Municipal Building in here. So he's world renowned and world known. What did he do? Well, one of the many things he did was working in cooperation because most of research is collaboration with his friend and chemist, Lynn Enslow in 1918. So this was 105 years ago. He standardized the methods used to chlorinate Baltimore and other major cities drinking water supplies. He didn't invent or not find chlorine, but what he did was develop the right dose of chlorine to go into our drinking water, enough to kill the bacteria, not too much to kill the people. He's credited with saving more lives with respect to water and sanitation than anyone in the world because we still use those principles and process today in our drinking water treatment plants. The right dose of chlorine removes the microorganisms, can protect public health. So it was truly phenomenal and we're honored and I'm honored to be part of a university where this individual came. I did not meet him. I met his son, Reds Woolman, who recruited me to Hopkins, who also worked in water for about 53 years and they overlapped his son, Abel Woolman and his son, Reds Woolman. So others have also done some studies on the approaches that I just described. 
And here is from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It's the mortality rate, typhoid fever in the United States. Typhoid fever comes from a bacteria. It's still present in many parts of the world. But in the United States, we can see the mortality rate per 100,000 population. In the last century, it was quite high. Almost 30 people per 100,000 died from this one type of bacteria. And then you see a precipitous drop in the United States and other high income countries. And what was going on? Well, chlorination and filtration of water, which was initiated, helped contribute to this very precipitous drop. So we don't have typhoid fever in the United States. We don't have cholera. It does not mean we don't have other problems, but we've taken care of this. Others are also interested in this. And there was a study that was done by the British Medical Journal. And they did a poll to find the greatest medical breakthrough since 1840. So they conducted this online poll. They did a list of initially suggested um, readers, and then they had everyone who was a medical doctor, a nurse, or worked in healthcare vote on the top 15 to see which one would be number one. And you can imagine, because I based this lecture and setting this up, that yes, sanitation, clean water and sewage disposal emerged as the winner as the single greatest medical breakthrough since 1840. It beat out antibiotics, which are very important, anesthesia, which is very important if you're going into surgery, and even vaccines. So across many disciplines, not just public health practitioners like myself, not just engineers, but even in the medical profession, we know how important it is to have clean water and the ability to remove our waste and wash our hands. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those things as well. So how much water do we use in the United States and other high income countries? Well, freshwater use over 40 billion gallons a day are treated water, meaning potable drinking water. For those that are in the metric system, you could just multiply by four. So we have here is 160 uh, billion liters. Another 300 billion gallons a day are untreated for water in agricultural and industry. So as an individual, how much water do you use per day? I don't know if very many people know this answer. Some might guess in there. And so just think about a minute, well, how much water do I'm using? And this is water for not only drinking, but bathing, cooking, flushing away the waste and all that. And you might be surprised in the United States, it's 70 to 100 gallons. 265 to 378 liters per person per day. That's a very large amount of water. A vast majority of that water is actually used for other purposes besides drinking. And it's high quality water, but we use it for other things like even watering our gardens and washing our cars. Well, there's challenges, even in the United States. This is a quote from Gandhi that sanitation is more important than independence. And for water pollution, in the US, things were quite bad. And there's what we call a tipping point. And a tipping point is where an event got everyone's attention. In this case, it was the Cuyahoga River fire that occurred in 1969 in Cleveland, Ohio. When you have a flammable sign on top of a river sign, that's usually not a good thing. When you have a river firefighting boat that's on fire itself, that's usually not a good thing. And what happened was the Cuyahoga River was so polluted, it would catch on fire. And it caught on fire many times. This picture for the fireboat is actually from 1952. But this one event in 1969 got the attention of the public enough that they told the legislature, they told their Congress people and others that we must do something. So then in 1972, just a few years later, a federal legislation was passed called the Clean Water Act. And the act involved two parts. First was zero discharge of pollutants. And the second one, which was wise, is they provided money for cities to build wastewater treatment plants so that we could decrease the amount of waste going in our environment. The goal of this act was to make all navigable waters fishable and swimmable. Now, Johns Hopkins University is in Baltimore, Maryland on the East Coast, and we have uh, the Chesapeake Bay, and we have an inner harbor. 
here at Johns Hopkins. Sadly, this inner harbor is still not completely clean. I would not swim in it. But we have laws in place in the United States that allows us, if we're able to enforce them, to reduce pollutants. Many countries in the world don't even have the laws in place. So how can you enforce things if you don't even have the laws? So we have these wonderful controls if we're able together as a society to enforce them. And importantly, just two years later, another act was passed called the Safe Drinking Water Act. And this was to protect public health by regulating the nation's drinking water supply. And so the Environmental Protection Agency has legally enforceable national health-based standards to protect against both naturally occurring and man-made contaminants to be found in drinking water. This act has been amended several times as our understanding of contaminants involved. And you might be surprised that there are over 91 contaminants that are regulated in all our tap water. These include microorganisms, but also chemicals and the disinfections that we use and the potential disinfection byproducts that are produced. So all these are in place so that when you go to a city or any publicly owned water treatment plant, you can be reasonably assured that you're not going to die because we have controls in place. Truly a powerful and wonderful thing. Well, all is not perfect. There are challenges we have in high income countries. In particular, we're gonna focus on three things, just as the examples. The first one is aging infrastructure. The drinking water pipes and wastewater pipes are getting old. The other one we're just gonna use as an example is that there is lead that can potentially be in drinking water. This is problematic. And finally, we'll briefly talk about water contaminants not regulated by the Safe Drinking Water Act. These are chemicals of emerging concern. And just a couple slides on a particular one called per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFOS. So the first is about our infrastructure. Now, every three years, there is a society called the American Society of Civil Engineers that does a report card on all of America's infrastructure. They have 17 different areas that they look at and they give it a grade. For example, aviation, a grade of D plus, bridges, dams. The overall grade of infrastructure in the United States is a C minus. Now, if you're working in school, whatever grade you are in yourself there, a C minus, eh, not so great. If we focus on what I work on, water and sanitation, drinking water is a C minus, wastewater is a D plus. So we have much that we have to do in this grading report in here. One of the biggest challenges is all those pipes are getting old and we're not funding, we're not paying to replace those pipes. So there's a lot of leaks that can occur. And if you live in a high income country in a city and you walk down the street, sometimes you'll see water coming out that's um, from a break, broken pipe. So this is a significant problem. So here's an example of how old things are. And in Baltimore, they did an estimate where the average drinking water pipe is 75 years old. This is very old. They're usually designed for about a life of 50 years. So we're well over that lifespan. And when you have an old pipe, they can break and leak. The other thing about old pipes is that they can actually have things build up inside the pipe. This is a, a cutaway of a drinking water pipe. And you have the water here, but you can also see this is called what we call biofilm. This is a gelatinous mass that can grow inside our pipes. And within this biofilm can be microorganisms that can slough off and they cause problems in our drinking water. So we have to be concerned about this. The amount of chlorine that we have in the water, if you remember Abel Woolman, can improve this drinking water by reducing these amount of microorganisms. This picture here is the inside of a cutaway of a pipe that was taken out. And this is that gelatinous mass. You can also see here in this part of the slide, that there's actually iron and things built up in these pipes. You would think it'd be clean on the inside. You can see there's a lot of debris and iron that's built up inside the pipe. Now the iron, not necessarily a, a health risk, but you, that's the flow of that pipe is dramatically decreased. So aging infrastructure is incredibly important to take care of and a challenge. And just last year in Baltimore, as an example, is that we did have a boil water notice in part of Baltimore. I work right here in Johns Hopkins, which is in this spot, and then the entire area of the city right here had a boil water notice. 
Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing because what it means is that the city was monitoring the drinking water. And when they found, in this case, an E. coli in the drinking water, that set an alert off. So they told people, don't use the water until we fix it. They went back and they found the leak that was causing things to come into that piped water and they fixed it so that they actually had a monitoring system so things didn't continuously get bad. It's not great to have a boil water notice, but it does mean that there is a system in place. And an article came out just a week later that, that, that showcased how Abel Woman, this article was in Baltimore, it's one of the newspapers here, and that this E. coli scare was a reminder of Baltimore's pioneering history of safe civic water systems. This is Abel Woman. And because he used the system of chlorination and others, he was able to develop that approach that we still use in place now to keep these microorganisms at bay. So we can't rest on our laurels is what that means. You have to constantly monitor, monitor the water. The next issue that I'm going to describe is lead in drinking water. Now lead is an element, means it never goes away. It's not degraded or detoxified. There is no biological purpose for lead. It has been used for thousands of years. And so there is no biological function. It is of health concern. If there's any lead present in drinking water, that is of health concern. And one of the challenges here is that besides water, which we'll talk about in a minute, lead can be found in other things such as old paint. So houses that are quite old used to have lead in the paint and this lead can then chip off into small paint flakes that children can eat. Children's jewelry and lunch boxes can actually contain high levels of lead. So gifts from, especially in low income countries where they're making this, where it has high lead. A child is given a necklace that has lead in it, they'll put it in their mouth because they're sucking on a necklace. They can get high doses of lead. So this is very problematic and you have to be careful about it. It can also be on even wrapping materials and other uh, what's called new cyndicals. These are supplements that are not protected under regulations. But in drinking water, lead can be a problem in a home. And so what happens is lead is not a big issue in the sources of water we use to drink. Where it becomes a problem is in the pipes. Some of the older cities had lead pipes. Lead is very easy to bend and malleable. It lasts a long time, but it can leach out the lead into the drinking water. So a lead pipe is a big problem. Flint, Michigan had lead in their pipes many years ago, and it led to a big issue about trying to take care of the children and, and others in that community. So you have lead that can be in the service lines here, but also lead can be in older homes. Within the home, there's lots of pipes, and then the, some of these fixtures can have lead or lead soldering in. Newer homes, after about 1975 or so, they remove the lead from the solder. So this is usually in older homes that are quite old, but there are many older homes, especially in older communities. So lead can build up. So the Environmental Protection Agency has developed a lot of programs to say, what is the problem of lead and how can you remediate it? And we, as part of our project, is also looking at detection levels of lead in small and, and urban environments that are in these communities here. And there's three simple things that can be done. First, you can flush pipes. So if you're in a home in the morning, you should, what they, they say, the Biomore Protection Agency says, that you should flush them for about two to three minutes before you use it to drink. And you might say, well, I wanna conserve water. So some people use buckets and the buckets they can water their garden or they take a shower first because it's not from showering that you get the lead problem, it's from drinking it. So flush the pipes is very important in the morning. Second thing, no one should be using hot water for cooking. You should always use cold water for consumption, both drinking and especially for doing things like making baby formulas because infants are very susceptible to lead. Why is that? Well, as you, if you use hot water, the elevated temperature of the water can dissolve more lead. So if there is lead in the house, elevated temperatures are more problematic. So you should always cook and drink with cold water because there'll be less lead if it is present. And finally, they can be tested. There's groups and organizations that help test the water to see if the home has some problems to uh, further remediate if needed. The last one we're gonna talk about are these chemicals of emerging concern. 
In a particular, you might have heard about this in the news, and if not, we'll describe why it's important, is per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFOS. Been a lot of uh, reports in the literature about this being problematic and being present in drinking water. And so why this one? So first, what are PFOS? The per is this is a carbon bond, and this is fluorine. So the carbons are completely covered with fluorines. And the poly means some of the carbons have different open areas, they're not all fluorine. So you have fluorine, and then you add it to a carbon chain called an alkyl substances. And there's thousands of these different ways that you can make different types of PFOS. So what makes PFOS unique? What makes this bond unique? Well, and if you haven't had chemistry yet, it's a wonderful science, and hopefully you can get excited about it as well in there and, and, and question about why we, we understand it. But this is the purpose of the challenge. So you have carbon and fluorine. So fluorine is the most electronegative element in the periodic table. It's number nine at the periodic table. If you haven't had this yet in chemistry, you will. And there is importance on that. And so the periodic table. So when fluorine binds to carbon, it forms the strongest bonds in organic chemistry. Now, this is very powerful for making things, right? If you have a strong bond, you can easily make things. And it's heat and chemical tolerant. It's both lipophobic and hydrophobic. So lipids are fats, so it doesn't let fats come in and it doesn't let water come in. So you could think of it as kind of a protection of what you put it on. And it's surfactant properties in the air and water. Because it's such a tight bond, if we try to get rid of it, then we have a problem because it's very hard to rip apart this bond. So these things stay around for very long periods of time. They're called forever chemicals because it's very hard to remove them from the environment once they've been put in place. And what are the uses of PFOS? They're around the world. There are fluoropolymers manufacturing. Teflon and Scotchgard contains PFOS. This has been put on fabrics such as couches and chairs to prevent stains in there. There's also this aqueous film forming foams called AFFF that's used for firefighting. So in firefighting at different airports and the military, they suppress fires by spraying a foam on it to deplete the oxygen. This foam contains PFOS. And this foam that's then put in the, on the fire, which could be a good thing, can then get into the groundwater. And problematic, they're in everyday products. And this is uh, a stain defender on the khaki pants. This is on a Teflon coated pan. The inside of popcorn bags used to have a lot of PFOS in it, and our clothing, such as Gore Tex, in there. Why are we concerned about PFOS? Well, one of the things is that we're starting to know that you can have adverse health outcomes thyroid disease, increased cholesterol levels, et cetera. And in particular, in pregnant women, the developing fetus, you can have a very challenging low birth weight and a reduced response even to vaccines. So the exposure of the mother has consequences to the fetus at very low concentrations. So finding out where this PFOS is and then how we remediate it is quite important. So my group, research group, is looking to study PFOS, and we have different ways that PFOS can go into our environment. It can be uh, uh, essentially atmospheric deposition. It can get into the groundwater. And so what I've been studying is three different areas. One is looking at potable water in here. And so part of this would be perhaps some bottled water. So I'll show you an example of that. We've looked at it, how do we treat groundwater to remove PFOS? And there's some exciting ways you can do it, mostly with activated carbon. And finally, when all this stuff gets into our landfills, the landfills can actually leak out fluids called leachates, and PFOS can be present in those, and this can be problematic. So let me use one example here. Is we did a study where um, a research associate in my laboratory looked at PFOS in bottled water. And he collected 101 different types of bottled water and did this research. And we found it 40% detection rate and 15 different types of PFOS were detected. Now, it's important to note that not all bottled water is the same. There are much lower concentrations in purified water. So when you have bottled water, you can have it different types. If it is taken from the municipal water and further treated, that's called purified water, had low levels of PFOS because they're doing distal treatment. 
natural spring water that's bottled, there's no regulations on it. And if there's PFAS in that natural spring, because it's ubiquitous, you can have PFAS present in the bottled water there. It's important, it's very important to note that these concentrations are very low. So there's no drinking water regulatory limits in bottled water yet for PFAS, but even low levels can be problematic. So we did the study and reported this in the literature just a couple of years ago, and it's gotten other people uh, looking at it that perhaps we should consider being uh, regulating or even our bottled water to make sure we protect our environment. So I'm gonna shift gears and tell you the other part of the story of my research, and just the exciting things that you're able to do in public health, link engineering and my other colleagues. And this is a focus on what about water sanitation and hygiene? in low and middle income countries. Yes, this is me here in a dugout canoe in the rural region of, of Nicaragua where we were looking at these simple clay pots that would remove microorganisms. So first to set the stage of just how challenging this is. Over 800,000 children, 0.8 million children under five die from diarrheal diseases every year. So it's still an ongoing problem. Every 40 seconds, a child dies from a diarrheal disease. So estimated more than half the hospital patients suffer from water-related diseases around the world. And we know that improved water access and sanitation can dramatically decrease this burden. And here's an example of a challenge. This is a household that's living in Lima, Peru. It's a household of seven. This is their water supply for half a week. It is in open containers. If you store water in an open container, things can get into it. So that's a problem. They have no running water. This is where they urinate and defecate. It's just a uh, uh, basically a platform that's good, a little bit of privacy. All the urine feces flows in and directly into this compound. There are a million people living outside of Lima, Peru that are in these peri-urban environments that don't have access to adequate sanitation or drinking water. So in one city, in one country in South America. This is across the world a major problem. Hundreds of millions of people don't have high quality access to both sanitation and drinking water. So what are the overall basic water requirements? How much water do individuals need? They've done some studies on this. And they say the minimum, the minimum standard to meet the four basic needs, not in an emergency, but over a period of time, is 40 to 50 liters per person per day. This is for drinking, cooking, sanitation, and bathing. And here's a startling fact about water. It's heavy. And in Africa, women and girls spend 40 billion person hours a year hauling water. This woman has 30 liters on her head of water. 30 liters weighs 30 kilograms, weighs 66 pounds on her head. Here I am, we're doing some studies in this water in Ghana. I've got my boots on, I've got my gloves on. Sadly, when we did the study, this water has many E. coli, e. coli it has viruses such as norovirus, and it has a neglected tropical disease called schistosomiasis, where if you wade in the water, you can get schistosomes that can go in there. So this is highly polluted water. This woman is carrying up to her household of five, about a half a kilometer away every day. So it's challenging. And this next picture is what keeps me up at night. This next picture is of a young girl in Africa. At best, she weighs 30 kilo, kilo, kilograms. She's quite small. This is an 18 liter, 18 kilogram can of water, jerry can of water. She carries this and she has a permanently deformed neck. Musculoskeletal issues are a major problem carrying water on your head when you're young or even when you're old, heavy water is a challenge. And she won't go to school. And she won't go to school. It's not because she's hauling water. She hauls water very early in the morning. We did the studies on that. She won't go to school probably, and we don't know for sure, just her, but in general, because there's no place for her to urinate and defecate when she's at school for the girls. And as she matures and gets older, there's no place for her to manage her ministries. So part of my research has been involved in what can we do to allow these young girls to stay in school and how can we empower women to be able to have safe, sustainable approaches to drive economic change. And part of this is worldwide. 
there are around the world, it was come to agreement that we would develop what's called sustainable development goals. And this is an agenda that would transform by the year 2030, all these approaches. So it's a set of goals to end poverty, protect the planet and ensure prosperity for all. Very ambitious, there's no question about it. There's 17 of them, no poverty, no hunger, quality education, gender, and here clean water and sanitation. And to set the stage for water, one of the challenges is population is a key factor in the water scarcity paradigm. And this is leaders for day over time, and then time can be in, in um, years or even decades, and the available water is here. Population and demand is increasing, and on top of that is climate change. What climate change is doing is adding variability. So there's very a little variability of water means there's less available water with climate change. So this is a big problem. So one of the drivers for water sanitation hygiene, we'd be connecting this to how can we reduce the uh, population where uh, individuals might not want to have as many children in there. So on top of this study that was going on, we can see here that these are the sustainability goals. If we look at specific goals like number three, good health and well-being, it also ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services, including family planning. Goal five, gender equity, serves universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. And then clean water and sanitation, goal six here, so I have access to adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all and end open defecation where people don't have toilets and they're defecating in the field paying special attention to the needs of women and girls and those in vulnerable situations. While this was going on around the world, there was also a program called Family Planning 2020, which was to develop an approach to get 120 million additional women having access to modern contraception in there. And they almost achieved this goal and they're readjusting it and they're now going to 2030. So what's going on here is linking family planning with water sanitation and hygiene to drive change for women empowerment. And if you're going to have these goals, it's incredibly important that you have a monitoring system in place to see how well you're trying to reach them. So I was part of a team that developed what's called performance monitoring and accountability. And this was a, called a Sentinel survey platform to generate monitoring data, because with information, you can help drive change. So we studied these projects in 11 countries, many in Africa, but also in India and Indonesia. And we worked with local universities and local organizations. We made sure that this was collaboration and that the questions and things that were coming to us in PMA 2020 were coming from our local partners. So what were the goals? The goals were to monitor progress and access to and use and contraception as well as beyond the conventional monitoring for water, sanitation, and hygiene. It's one of the first ones that's able to do this. And the idea was a rapid collection of data that you can get annual estimates, and then importantly, get this information back out to those that can drive change. So we did this by surveys. We did Sentinel household surveys on demand and use, where we had household questionnaires and female questionnaires as well as went out into the community where there's access points, the hospitals and local communities there ask about supply and access. So how well have we done? Well, there's been many different rounds. We've had over 500,000 interviews and we've trained 2,700 what we call resident enumerators. And this is a woman who is using a mobile platform. So these are cell phones that they're able to be trained on to ask these questions. So we no longer use paper questionnaires, we use mobile platforms for questionnaires. And the individuals and the resident enumerators are so important. One provides jobs to them and it's also the right individual asking the questions, especially sensitive questions. It would not be someone like me going to these communities, it would be local community individuals that are trained, that are ready to answer the questions, but also peer to peer almost, where they are accepted in the community. And you know, it's incredibly important to do that. So how does it work? A resident enumerator will ask questions at household level or even at the hospitals about access to contraception and stockouts and also water and sanitation. They would then transfer this data to a cloud that was owned by the local universities that we were working with. So we were sharing this information from the very beginning 
in there. They were then, the questionnaires were surveyed and made sure that the quality insurance was there. And then we put it into visualization, so I'll show you, and disseminate it as quick as possible within weeks, in many instances, to the local communities and the local government so they could drive change. So it was really an integrated, exciting part of that. So I focused on the water sanitation side of it. And we did what's called indicators for water. We said, what is the main and regular use of water? Was it reliable? Did you always get the water? Many places in the world, you turn on the tap, the water doesn't come. And also, how far did you have to walk to get your water? These are important questions. And for sanitation, it's what type of facility did you have? Did you have a toilet? And importantly, if you had a toilet of some sort, was the waste taken care of? Or did it just fill, filled up and then flow into a compound? So managing the waste was important in there. And then child feces disposal is also very important. Many parts of the world don't have diapers. And so children will defecate out into uh, common areas that can transmit disease if you're not careful. And for hygiene, an important part of this was access to not only sinks, but did the sink have water and did it have soap? So if you're going to wash your hands, you can count sinks, but if you don't see if the sinks work by turning the water on, and if there's no soap, it really doesn't help. And importantly, we also developed a program called Menstrual Hygiene and Management, which is now Menstrual Health and Hygiene. And this is where we, see, we ask questions about where were uh, women managing uh, their hygiene in there, and was it safe, private, and clean, and I'll describe this in a minute. So what were we, were we able to do when we get these surveys? For example, this is one of the many reports that we put in for five sub-Saharan African countries, Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, Uganda, Kenya, and Ghana. And these are just two of the many questions as the examples we did today. First one was, what percent of the households and population regularly practiced open defecation, meaning they didn't have a toilet? And you can see, sadly, that in Ethiopia, 41% of the individuals openly defecated in Burkina Faso, a country there, 74% of the individuals were openly defecating. Uganda, Kenya, and Ghana were better with lower numbers of people open defecating. They had toilets. The next question was, if you had a place to wash your hands, was there soap and water there? And sadly, in Ethiopia, only 10% of the population had water access with soap at a sink. Burkina Faso, 2%. Uganda, only 6%. Kenya, 14%. And Ghana, 7%. So countries that didn't have much open defecation, meaning a low number here, you'd love to see this number very high way up here, but they didn't have access to the hand washing. Why is this important? Well, this is ability to show information to the local communities and the leaders to say, here's where you might want to invest resources to drive the biggest change. And it might be something about how we use an available source, such as soap, a locally available one, with entrepreneurs that can sell the soap at a price that they can be afforded. So it's not just counting sinks or counting toilets, it's what can we do with this? So that's been really exciting to be able to share this information. And the next one, and the last one on this, is about menstrual health and hygiene. So menstrual health and hygiene refers to the practice of using clean material to absorb menstrual blood that can be changed privately, safely, hygienically, and often as needed during the duration of the menstrual cycle. Women and girls face challenges to manage the menstruation around the world, and failures to address menstrual health and hygiene needs can have negative consequences for basic hygiene, sanitation, and reproductive health. So the first part of this is getting that open dialogue to have everyone part of the understanding of it. And the next is really trying to figure out what is going on in these communities in there. So progress towards the sustainable development goals of gender equality depends on adequate menstrual health and hygiene. There's no question about that. And so we need everyone to start talking about this and also figuring out where there is a need. And this is one example and in Ethiopia, 28% of the women in Ethiopia report having everything they need to manage their menstruation. Didn't vary by age. So this means that over 70% did not have everything adequate to manage menstruation. And then what we did is we broke it apart from rural and urban. And we we're asking specific questions. Urban is purple. Was it clean? 60% said the location was clean. 
but only 30% rural areas had clean environments. Was it private? It was higher numbers, 60 for the uh, rural, and higher for the urban. Safe, so it was safe, less than 60% of the women in urban said it was a safe environment, and only 30% said it was a safe environment in, in rural areas. And sadly, they weren't able to lock the area where they're managing the menses, less than 10% were able to lock it. And then sadly, uh, there was very inadequate soap and water for them to manage the menstruals in, in the urban was 40% and a little bit over 20% before that. So what does this mean? This means you can provide this information to say these might be areas where we want to drive change and not just providing the material, but providing access to safe and, and places where they feel secure. Importantly, when we generated this information, we shared it on our phones, but we also shared it um, in different ways to disseminate it. And we also made sure that we translated it so that it was in the local language. For example, in Nigeria, it was in French, and in Rajasthan and in India, it was in Hindi. So that those that needed the information didn't have to have a proficiency in English, they could learn in their own language in there. And we actually did a pictorial too on cell phones as well. We made it. We made it through all the exciting research that I've been able to, to do and share with you and all that. It's just a snapshot and a quick summary. Water is finite and precious resource. Now give it some thought while you're brushing your teeth. Where did this water come from? How do I know it's safe? Knowledge of your own water is incredibly important. Fresh water is not distributed uniformly across the earth. We know we're gonna have water challenges in there. And in many countries are facing water stress or water scarcity resulting in political conflict and economic hardship. And one of those countries is the United States. It is not distributed uniformly across the US and there's places in the United States where there's incredible water stress. And sadly, it's a lot of it's in our indigenous populations. The Navajo Nation, Diné population, for example, is in a dry, arid place. And they're trying and, and working hard to have equitable water access. We have the knowledge and technology to treat water in the, in the world. We have that knowledge. But you must have appropriate selection to include an understanding of human behavior and economic capacity. Just saying this is the tool that you should use will never work. Listening to the community, getting an understanding of what their needs are, and then trying to work with them is incredibly important. And it's humbling, but it's exciting because I learn so much when I go out into the communities and they teach me how to be a better researcher and what I should be asking and how to listen. So what can you do? Well, I'm a public health practitioner. I'm an environmental microbiologist. The single most important thing you can do, I have to say, is wash your hands. What your mother told you is still important. So wash your hands and do that appropriately. But what else? Conserve water. It's finite. It's precious. We have to take care of this valuable resource. And watershed protection, it makes sense. Clean water in, if you're taking water for drinking, for example, much easier if you start with clean water to end up with clean water out where you're trying to deliver it to individuals in there. And finally, let the legislators know that indoor plumbing is important, tap and toilet and infrastructure is important for all of us around the world. And that should be part of the process of discussions in there. So just two vignettes. Every year on March 22nd is World Water Day. And they choose a theme and one of them is about climate change and all that. So we have a day where everyone should be aware of water. We also have a World Toilet Day. On November 19th of every year is World Toilet Day. And worldwide, more people have access to a mobile phone than a toilet. 2.5 billion people don't have access to clean and safe toilets. And menstruating women and girls stay at home when there's no toilets at work or school. And one fifth of the schools worldwide have no toilet facilities at all. So we have much work to do. We've come a long way, both in high income countries and low income countries, but we have a long way to go. And I didn't do this alone. There's many members of my research team and my collaborations. I can't thank them all, but that's an important part of the process. And that's the end of my story. So thank you for your time. And I hope I was able to share a little bit of the information for you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Schwab. I really enjoyed your presentation. So I have one. Uh, I have uh, one uh, question: Is that with with these problems arising, as you mentioned, how can we as students help to uh, help to solve? Uh, these water issues how can we like like this can go from like making changes in our lives to like maybe helping others uh do you have any ideas how we could do that 
Yeah, that's a great question. And when I get in, people always say, oh, I can't do anything. It's so hard, right? So it starts with local change. It starts with individuals like yourselves that say, I want to make a difference in setting. I try to lead by example. I'm not perfect at that, you know, in my climate footprint and all that. But I think there's local things that you can do individually, like conserving water in your own home or working on the communities in there. There's also knowledge is very important and how we disseminate that information is also important. So sharing information that you feel is accurate and representative into the platforms that we use now is also a powerful tool. How do you know if it's true or not, right? How do you vet that information? So there are respected government agencies that do work hard to disseminate information. In the US, it's Center for Disease Control, EPA, and the national, it's World Health Organization. So we can start sharing the information on the needs there. That's one of the steps, but thank you for that question. Next question. Okay. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Enrico from California. Uh, hi, so uh, thank you for presenting and taking the time to do so. I found your presentation very helpful and insightful, and I'm also interested in public health, and this has like only like furthered my interest in it. So my question is that as the world continues to modernize and utilize, for example, factories to keep up with uh, demand, in your experience, what do you think is the best way to combat uh, pollution and water contaminants? Oh. Wow, that's, that's also a good question in the sense of how big a scale can we make a difference in there? So I think one of the things that we have to be aware in high income countries, there are laws that are already in place that are being rejected, meaning they're not being enforced. So there's something about promoting what's already existing to say, we as communities and even yourselves can say, I want to hold people accountable that they have to adhere to our basic laws that we have in place to protect our water, ensure our health. The other thing is, is that, again, as we go forward, what your generation will face is the challenges uh, of climate change, which I didn't get into in a lot of detail in there, but that's going to make everything more variable, it's going to make it harder. But having that understanding of, of community dynamics, and I do, I personally believe the students are the glue to drive change. Your interest in my research makes me excited because I try to share the knowledge, but it's up to you to try to choose how to make a difference. It's not easy. But setting those examples and working forward, and if you're able to get in a place where you learn and you're able to communicate to others, having successful communication, I can't stress it enough, the ability to write succinctly, to share your information, and you are going to be using technology I don't even know about. When I started my career, these weren't around. There was no cell phones around in there at all, and I've adapted to it. I don't know what's going to happen in 20 years, but you are the generation that's going to make that drive change, hopefully for a positive and good. I'll stop there. I can go on forever, but we've got lots of other questions. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Kian from Missouri. Uh, hi, Dr. Schwab. I really wanted to ask, um, as the climate crisis becomes more of an issue, um, have you seen sort of water sanitation become uh, more difficult in areas where uh, like the water system might not be as centralized? So there is no question that the everywhere in the world is becoming more stressed. So you're spot on about that. One of the exciting opportunities that we have is I talked to you and, and, and part of it, I told you, like, we make a lot of water. We make 40 billion gallons a day of what's called potable water, but we only use less than 1% directly for drinking and use in public use. The reason we made a bunch of water was because we also use that potable water for fire suppression in our buildings. So we have to have big pipes to keep enough water if there is a rare event of fire. The idea that we need to go forward is what's called decentralization, perhaps, where you don't treat all that water for drinking, you treat some of it for drinking and the rest you can have lower quality water for the rare events of fire and all that. So changing the way we think about this is incredibly important, but not to leave out the marginalized populations. They rely on us as a society to provide an equitable, reasonable way for water to be delivered to everyone in the community. That does not mean that we can't all put together ways to pay for this where we support those that are the more marginalized populations in, a, in a, tier, a tiered way, but there has got to be skin in the game. If I give you something 
you rarely take it to the value of then if it's part of where you had to earn it or you put some other interest in there. So there's neat ways that we can start thinking about this economically as a driver instead of just public health or just water. But as we decentralize, we can go forward. I'll stop there too I'm, it's, and we'll, we'll keep going on for questions. Uh, thank you. Next, we have Liva from New York. Um, uh, I just want to start by saying thank you for your presentation. And uh, I actually had a, a question in more specific. In the beginning of your presentation, you talked about chlorination. So I was wondering if you think more concern needs to be paid to the potential risk of antibiotic resistance genes in the wastewater after chlorination. Ah, so antibiotic resistance genes or parts of genetic information can be problem. There's no question about that. Um, the chlorination, so this is actually, a, a, a brings up an excellent point. I tell people chlorine is good because it reduces the microbes that can kill you very quickly. The same breath, I say chlorine is bad because it can cause problems down the road with disinfection byproducts and other issues with chlorine. Everything is a trade-off. And so what we need to do is not ignore those key drivers that can help keep public health at a stable level, but maybe we can do approaches where we address what we find information like the antibiotic resistance that is in bacteria is incredibly problematic. Tens of thousands of people in the U.S. alone, hundreds of thousands are dying from antibiotic resistant bacteria where we're inappropriate using the antibiotics. And a lot of it's for animal husbandry, which is not the way we want to use our antibiotics. So we have to make sure we don't ignore that. And it will become more problematic as we grow more animals. I do other studies on that as well in there. But I think we also can't ignore the core principles that kept us improving health. So that if you immediately focus, like I just mentioned, you like this perfluorinated compounds, they're very low levels, they're of concern. If we focus just on them and ignore the bacteria, the bacteria might come back. So it is a hard question. I don't have a good answer for you, but they can't be ignored and it will continue to be a problem. But together, if we as a society say we don't use antibiotics inappropriately, like for animal growth, we use them for appropriate needs, and we take care of the water, we can start improving the quality both in the U.S. and around the world. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have Arushi from Utah. Hi, I really enjoyed your presentation. It was really enlightening. Um, my question was, do you think a lot of water disparity and lack of access or equalized like access to good water happens because of environmental racism or, or classism or just different social factors that lead to people not having the best quality of water? I think there's clearly uh, an, an environmental justice issue with respect to equitable distribution of water and sanitation and hygiene. And even in the United States, you can, I don't know if you can see my background. I work at Johns Hopkins University, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. And just literally 300 yards from our university is some of the most challenging areas in the city with respect to water access because they're in very old parts of the city. So I work around the world, but I also work in Baltimore. And what we did is put a project together where we're looking at marginalized neighborhoods within a great city of the United States, meaning Baltimore, it's a wonderful city, but we have areas where we've ignored that particular region where the money wasn't available because people weren't yelling as much, so to speak, to try to get changed. So we're trying to say, what are the challenges? And the first thing we're doing we're bringing the community together and asking them, what do you see as your challenge? What do you want us to work with you to try to change to do? Because historically research used to be, I would come in with an idea, I would tell the community, this is my idea, do you, do you like it? Yeah, great, of course, instead of going, what do you think is your biggest problems? What do you think we should help you try to change? And that's a whole different way of doing research and it's changing, it's really exciting. The challenge, it takes time and it takes resources to do that, but together we can start doing it. So I do think there is marginalized populations. I do think that within high income countries, we see this as well. There was a study in Germany, which has a lot of the migrants that were coming in, that were coming in from uh, different parts of uh, the world. And they were even more marginalized in Germany, which has a very, what, people perceive as progressive way of providing water and sanitation and access in there. So great question. Short answer is yes. The long answer is together, we got to figure out ways of doing things differently. 
Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Faith from New York. Hi, Dr. Schwab. Thanks for the Hi. amazing presentation. My question is kind of similar to the last one. So according to the Source Global P PBC survey, 43% of white Americans say that they're very confident in their water, while only 24% of Black Americans and 19% of Hispanic Americans indicate the same degree of confidence. Do you think that there is a specific reason or remedy for this mistrust, or, or is there a major difference in the water quality of these communities? Wow, that's a great question. And also, I'll add on to your statistics there is that the more wealthy the individuals are in a community, the less bottled water they drink. So that lower marginalized individuals don't trust the water, spend way more money on bottled water than other people that have a perceived trust into it. So I would say to you, part of it is, is the way we share information has not been adequate across the communities. And for water in particular and sanitation, the pipes are underground. People can't see them. It's not like a smokestack where you can see this thing in there or even noise. It's, in, it's all underground until there's a problem. And what's happened is that we've ignored different regions within a distribution system. And so I think there's systemic ignoring because there's limited amount of money. We are going to need over $12 billion a year just to get pipes back into place. We're a trillion dollars in a deficit of repairing our, our pipes and infrastructure in there. The sad part of that is it should be equitable. Those that need the most changes should get those pipes first. And that's what happened with Flint, Michigan. They finally raised a voice where in Michigan, there was a state that didn't want to supply the water to Flint, which is near Detroit, because they were more marginalized. But they were forced to gain all this attention. So we have ways that we can do this if we have the will to. And I agree with you that there's challenges. And part of it's communication. Part of that's getting an understanding of, of this valuable resource, but also understanding it, it, it might be true in some instances. And so how do we develop ways to do that? Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have Sarah from Minnesota. Hi. Um, regarding PFAS, and thank you for talking on that because it's so important and not a lot of people know about it. Um, if there was like tight government regulation on PFAS, how much resistance do you think there would be from those large companies such as 3M that use PFAS in their in like a lot of their products? So there is resistance. There's no question about it that that the the companies have developed resistance. They also now there's enough attention to particular PFAS in general that these companies are putting billions of dollars in remediation. Now I'm going to tell you a kind of a sad thing in that is that the PFOS regulation is focusing on about 15 different types of PFOS. There are over 4,000 types of PFOS. And so what the companies have done, and this is, I can show other examples, instead of using the product that's being regulated, they make something that's very similar, but is not have the same amount of carbon fluorine bonds or doesn't have the same link in there. So it's not regulated and it can still cause the same health effects. And if you wanna have a challenge, if you've heard of bisphenol A, which is in plastic bottles, so BPA is bisphenol A, and so there was this thing about getting rid of bisphenol A because we knew it mimicked hormones and it can cause problems. So the plastic bottles, if you look at the bottom of your plastic, I don't know if someone has the bottom of a plastic bottle right there, um, you look and say BPA free, like a, a, my bottle here will say BPA free on it. Well, what the companies did, if you have a plastic bottle and you want to drop it, you need a plasticizer in there, it'll break. So they now have BP, E, and H as the alternative that has the same health effects as BPA. So we as a society need to stop regulating a single compound, but do it as a suite of compounds in there. So PFOS in, in Minnesota, 3M, the company uh, was one of the ground zeros of leaking all these um, uh, perfluorinated compounds into the groundwater. And so you're tuned into Minnesota that uh, the rest of the country is also having problems. I'll stop there. I'm so excited about telling you about all these neat things, but uh, I want the other questions to be able to be asked. Thank you. Next, we have Gabriel from uh, Canada. Dr. Schraub, thank you for your impactful presentation. I'm uh, extremely interested in the field of global health, but also in economics. So my questions are really um, like a mix of both. So what is the economical impacts that the alleviation of water contamination 
or um, waterborne diseases especially uh, creates especially for um, low income communities because like constructing better water infrastructure for example is extremely costly especially for those in low income uh, communities yeah again i think it's great that you're going to go into economics and do things that are uh abel woman used to call it public health through the back door he would never promote public health for public health purposes he would put it promote it through through economic challenges and economic solutions so that you then bring public health along because it's the driver of change, sadly, and actually powerfully is economics. So one of the challenges in there is how do we do this in a way that is going to make money for people, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it also is an approach that does no harm. That's where we have this challenge. And I think having people that are aware that there is green technology, right? You can call it life cycle analysis. There's economic drivers where it makes more sense to not waste water than it does because you have less cost of your water, you're less pollutants. So life cycle analysis now, if they have to, companies have to take care of their pollutants and you make that part of the cost of it, then they then reduce their pollutant uses in there. And there are economic ways to do that. So I think we have to listen to that. We have to say, if I tell you public health is important, only thing you should do is provide free water to everybody around the world. It will fail miserably. One, people won't take it. If you, if you give it to them, they won't take care of it. And two, that's not the way the world works. So we can be smart about this, have it be economic drivers, but make sure we're not doing unintended consequences. And those are the companies that I think will have the future. So when you go out there and you're entrepreneurs, and you've made your first or second company, and you're thinking about this, think about that sustainable approach to these companies that will allow profits to be made in ways. They're doing this now with electrification and all sorts of ways to getting in there. So neat question, keep up that good work and good luck on your economics, because that's not my forte. I'm a microbiologist, but I, I, I think it's great. Next one. Thank you. Next we have Sydney from Georgia. Hi, Dr. Schwab. Thank you so much um, for your presentation. I thought that was it was really interesting and um, informative. Um, my question is, uh, you talk a lot about, uh, or from some of your graphs that I saw, is like climate change and um, you know, like water stress and like the population growing. Uh, so my question yeah. for you is, um, so like, <laughs> how much like time or whatever until like other countries like that are well benefited with like their water supply like experience some kind of stress on like water supply and like when we need to be taking measures um to, yeah. to make sure we have enough that's my question so that's another a very good question i would say the time is beyond we are out of time and by that i mean that every country in the world is is going to be dealing with with climate change that is a fact it is established research we do not need more data on this is the worst day in the world because the climate's changing what we need are solutions and there's a wonderful woman who's working as um, on a project uh, dr jones who says what would we do if we got it right what would be the approach if we were able to stabilize whatever water for example in your country whatever country it is what would that do how because doom and gloom is not going to solve this solution right i did there's a lot of shock and awe to you i said oh this is bad but what i want to do is say if we got this right how would our lives be better and one of the ways for water reuse, which I didn't get into is a group that is promoting water reuse in a big way are golfers people that play golf because golf is takes a lot of water, but if they're reusing the water in a golf course, then they are able to reduce their footprint and they might be able to keep a golf course. And golfers sometimes are able to communicate to others unlike the normal groups of, of public health. So getting people engaged and involved and making them be aware, if we get this right, you will have a better chance of your grandchildren playing golf. You would be, have a better chance for us as a society is going in there. And, um, there, you know, Uma Thurman, who's working on this and saying she's an activist about climate change, is also now proponing that let's let's do these things and drive some change in there. So I believe in in, in our species. I have faith in it, uh, and it's going to take a lot of work. And I think you, by being here, are part of that solution as we go forward. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Vinay from Utah.
Hello. Um, so first off, thank you for coming and presenting. I'm, I found this presentation quite interesting. So my interests are partially health and also policy making. So especially how we can use health information to make better policies. So my question is about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was passed two years ago. It in it part uh, there was a provision that involved investing in water recycling and reuse and invest the law allowed for one billion dollars by the government. So I was wondering how how useful is water recycling and reuse in terms of sustainability? Like how much of an impact is this going to have in terms of the research and stuff that you've done? Um, I personally believe that water reuse and reduction is going to be a major economic driver. Water, and I, I did this kind of joking, water is heavy. It takes an incredible amount of energy to move water around. If we can develop ways where we're using water wisely, where we're not treating the water, and, and this came back to a question about pipes are expensive too, right? But they're more expensive if you have to maintain high quality water through those pipes. So having what's called designer water, the right water for the right purpose is one of the ways. And that's part of the economic drivers, but also policy. So part of the way things change is through legislation. If there is a law, people then follow it or find ways to do to make that a more affordable way of going. Self-regulation is very hard for companies that are that are short profit uh, driven by, by quarters. So there has to be a fine dance. You don't wanna stop growth. I am pro growth, I'm pro us entrepreneurs, but I also need to make sure my own way of, of making sure no one's left behind. So these policy ways to do that, but still have economic change are hard. There's no question, it's not easy, but I do think that reduction of the water use has to happen. We've got to figure out a way because it's not sustainable in our current way. And there's also a thing, agriculture, 80% of the water use is for agriculture around the world. Few fractions of a percentage change in agriculture opens up vast amounts of water for other uses in there. So making agricultural water use be part of the program is something that should be considered as well. Not, and that's public health through the back door. So you get that agricultural use of less water, there's more water for other things, there's more water availability for communities. Next question. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a little bit longer, but I'm trying to keep it going, so. Thank you. Uh, next we have Wardla from Pakistan. Uh, hello, I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, recently, there's been this problem with more and more arsenic being found in Pakistani waters. Around 30% of the population is suffering from its after effects, consequences, you can say. So I've been working on a research where we're trying to develop um, crystalline sponges to remove that arsenic from water. And even though this isn't exactly correlated with what you talked about in your presentation, I wanted to know if there was any advice or if anything else that you would like to talk about. Yeah, you bring up a good point where some naturally occurring water uh, contaminants or constituents of concern, especially arsenic, um, can be very problematic. In uh, Nick, Pakistan and Bangladesh, where Bangladesh had major problems in there. So I think these, these chronic exposures are part of the challenge. So it's chronic diseases are now becoming across the world, obesity, diabetes, and things like that. As we reduce the microbial burden, meaning you don't die immediately, you have the opportunity to, to sometimes have other things come in its place. And so one of the challenges is making sure our water is safe beyond just the microbes. And in arsenic, that is one, and, and other fluoride is another one. Small dose of fluoride is good for your teeth, too much is bad for your bones in there. So having technology and tools that remove the contaminants in the region are very important. So better diagnostics and better reporting. I will give a caveat to this for everyone is that Making high quality water takes technology, but it's also doable. The challenge is protecting that water until it is drunk. So you can remove arsenic in different ways through charbone and all that. But if you store that in an open vessel where someone's fecally contaminated hands gets into that water, that whole vessel is recontaminated. So you can't just think I am getting rid of the arsenic and then the water is fine. And if it sits out for a week, it will become recontaminated by microbes. So we have to think about this in a broader approach. We call it source to sip, but those are very important questions. In many parts of the world, those are the bigger concerns. So great. 
Thank Next. you. Next, we have Ciara from Virginia. Hi, um, I found your presentation really interesting. So thank you so much. Um, so my question, I kind of have two. Um, the first one is how, like, what would be a likely, um, like a likely new technology that could be used to create um, or reduce PFAS, but something that's actually sustainable? Okay, you only get one question, so that's your top question. I'll answer that because the moderator told me. But so PFAS is an emerging contaminant. We have technology to remove it. One of them is granular activated carbon. The other one is called ion exchange. And ion exchange is the column where you actually exchange. The PFAS goes onto the column, and the column will then put something like salt back into the water so that you can trap it. Here's the problem. In a drinking water, there's low levels of these merging contaminants, such as PFAS. And a drinking water utility concentrates those low levels into a what's called granular activated carbon or something. They then have very high concentrated contaminant in this vessel that they have to do something with. And right now, one of the big concerns is the water utility didn't put it in the water but they're the ones concentrating, it becomes a hazardous material and the water utility might be responsible for dealing with this hazardous material that lays around forever, it's called forever compounds. That is not what we want to have happen to our water utilities. So regulations in place that say it is the responsibility of those that input it in to take it to what's called the, the, the grave part of it, cradle to grave. How do you get rid of PFAS? Well, there's ways you can do it. One of it is incineration not perfect and has to be very high temperatures and there's newer technologies where you can actually take the PFOS and then rip apart that fluorine carbon bond it takes a lot of energy when you do that and you just do it once you can have smaller parts of PFOS that can be more problematic so complete destruction is the way to go and that's energy intensive right now so there's a lot of work on trying to remove that great next question Thank you. Uh, before we go to the next, uh, before we go to Sean, I just want to check with you, uh, Dr. Shkarv, are you still good on uh, time? Should we try and get through these? Let's try, and I'll try to be shorter. But um, I have uh, at one thirty my time. I have to definitely jump on to another meeting, but I have a few more. You guys have questions? I'll try to answer as many as possible. Okay, great. So next we'll go to Sean from Maryland. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shkarv, for that presentation. I found that very intriguing. Uh, my question was: as we move towards more renewable energy technology and things like that to mitigate pollution. Do you think that would be a solution that would help alleviate some of the problems you mentioned? I do. So you say renewable energy is, is, is an approach on that. So it takes an incredible amount of water to mm -hmm. generate fossil fuels. It takes an incredible amount of water and nuclear energy, by the way, too because you have to cool it. It's thermal, pollution is significant. And in Europe this year, probably they're gonna to have to shut down some of the nuclear plants because the water is not cold enough to transfer the heat. So renewable energies with solar and with wind and even ge geothermal um, are, are definitely a ways to, to drive change. The grid, the power grid is another important part of this. We're stressing out how do you get that power to where you need it from places where there's lots of wind and all that. So there's many complexities to that, but that will be the future. The coal is, is, is clearly an uh, impact that's, that's causing problems across the world for uh, climate change. And we have to, to work on that. And we can make economic drivers for it. Great question. Next. Thank you. Next we have Arya from uh, Canada. Hi, Dr. Schwab. Uh, first off, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very eye-opening to a lot of issues I hadn't considered before. And I wanted to ask, do you think that the societal stigma against menstruation in many countries is con contributing to poor menstrual health and hygiene? I absolutely do. And part of my colleagues have also communicated that. Now, can you imagine an individual that looks like me talking about menstrual health and hygiene across meetings with hundreds of people and to people like yourselves, it is part of our biological process. It is part of how we are able to continue on as a species. It is incredibly important that we all destigmatize this and that we all accept this as part of a wonderful process that allows our you know, uh, continuation. That is a hard subject to bridge. And so my colleagues that have spent years on working on ways to communicate 
have effectively said we need to bring everybody up to speed, including boys and men, in addition to young girls who are yet to have the minarchy and then also women who are in the workforce, that together we can do this. And you know, a group that is working hard on this are sanitary engineers, because one of the problems is when you put menstrual products into, uh, into a, a toilet system, it clogs the toilet system up. So there's a constant need, especially in, in, in crisis, about how do we manage this? How do we develop the right toilets and places to manage ministries that are different, that are going to be gender appropriate and front and center, not an afterthought? And that's in, there are very exciting ways to do this from input of the women and from input of others in there that will drive change. It is a tough, it is so hard in many parts of the world where, where it's stigmatized even more. But in the United States, it is not one of your first conversations. I bet in your high school classes, it'll be a minimal conversation at all. And everyone should be aware of it. And it should be an open, transparent conversation with the respect, with the dignity that it needs as well. So great question. Sorry, I went longer on that. And I told everybody I'd be shorter, but. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Bavita from Arizona. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Schwab. Um, so I know in developed countries like the US, we have like huge water filtration tanks and we have several steps to um, sanitize water and make it safe for us to drink. But in developing countries where water filtration methods are scarce and sometimes ineffective, is there another low cost method that would effectively make water safe to drink for the people in that area? Yeah, um, that's a, that we call that the holy grail or silver bullet. Um, there is no such thing, but there are, are steps in there. So I used to have a problem, and I used to say, if my grandmother can't drink it, I won't use that system, meaning I have to be able to drink the water. What I realize now is that reduction of burden for microorganisms is as important as complete removing of all microorganisms, because it's called environmental entropy. It's a thriving of your body because we're insulted by microbes and the children on that. So to get rid of that approach means I have to accept that there is acceptable levels which might be easier to generate, such as the filtration that doesn't remove everything, but it reduces the burden. So there are ways to do that, but we have to maintain the protection of that water once it's been treated. So safe water means to sip. So if you do anything, never dig a well. Don't go out and dig well. Don't pay money for anybody to dig a well because it's going to fail. 50% fail. Why? Because they don't take care of them. And two, you don't protect the water once it's been obtained in there too. So the idea there is you can use a well, but then have to have protection. Great question. Though. Next. Thank you. Next, we have Kimia from Maryland. Um, hello, Dr. Schwab. I'm Kimia. I'd like to thank you for your presentation today. It was very informative. Um, so I was very interested in the work that you mentioned that you did with the um, 11 countries and use the questionnaires to gather information. And I was just wondering if you could give a brief explanation of the process of the data collection and data visualization that you mentioned after getting the information from the questionnaires. Yeah, it all started out with this, mobile platforms. And by the way, when you go in, in countries where it's humid and wet, these things die, they get water in them. So we had to develop an approach that you could have a robust way by a simple bag in there. And so the idea was training these women how to use mobile platforms. And by the way, it's called Open Data Kit. It's one of the many platforms that are, are universally available to share. We share this information. So the idea is, is that the women would be trained on this. And by the way, we pay them. They became entrepreneurs and they went on to other studies. So they'd be trained on how to ask the questions, how appropriately, how to manage the data. When it was available, we would download it or upload it from a wireless, but most of the time it was a data chip that then would be transferred over because all these places didn't have the cell phone capacity on that. So we developed an approach that was user-friendly, that had smart logic that would check questions. If you answered in an inappropriate way, if they put in 5,000 instead of 50, it would flag it immediately, that they couldn't answer it out of the parameters we set. So we made all these quality controls. And it was more robust data than paper surveys, which you get wet and you can't tell. So we developed this approach and then the local servers were driven by the local communities where they own the data, not us, and they're able to share it. And the cool thing is they could ask additional questions that were vetted. So as they came up and said, the, the resident numerator said, my, my community is asking about something else totally from what you're doing. We could ask and put those questions in very quickly. So it was a very powerful tool. Take a look at it. I know it's past now. The, the, the dates are, are changed now. They've gone on to other things, but it's a very powerful tool. Thank you. 
next next couple ones maybe i'll try to answer as many as i can but it might be a little bit shorter sorry thank you next we have three from massachusetts hi thank you for your very informational discourse um i know that improving the efficiency of the rural workforce is vital for development in communities and areas that have been suffering from resource insecurity most importantly a lack of accessible water and I think you touched upon the subject when talking about how African girls and women's and local workforces transport waters in ways that adversely affect their physical health. So, and this may be more specific to your research, um, what are the current efforts in improving the transportation of water in rural areas? Wow, what a wonderful question. So the idea there is, is how do we reduce the distance and or, and or how do we, we make, make it a mechanical approach? And so one of the, it's not easy. First answer, it's very hard and um, to, to develop a system that'll work and still be safe. There are mechanical uh, leverages systems like rollers, they call them hippos that you roll water around. So they're working on this. It's not perfect. You hit on something that's incredibly important and so hard to do. And part of that is distance to water. So having water access where you might have pipes going in that would then go to a treatment. So you can take poor quality water and then treat it very locally in there. Pipes are expensive and they break. So there's no easy answer. I wish I had one. Uh, they're working on this and this will be a continued problem. As water gets stressed, they have to walk further, not closer in there. So I wish I had a simple answer for you, but. That would be a great career and research in there that could drive change. Sorry, next question. Next, we have Lena from Tennessee. Hi, so thank you so much for taking the time to present. And I remember last year I was working with a group to try to create a biomimicry related solution to like the sixth UN Sustainable Development Goal. So I was wondering what is your take on like biomimicry and like using nature to like solve problems, especially when it comes to like water like treatment solutions? I think one, I think there's a lot of potential in that. And I think also I work with the Diné population, the, the Navajo Nation in there who have been working in a water, living in a water stressed area for, for hundreds of years. Their technologies that they developed then are what we perhaps consider now about rain gardens. There's, there's small dams of sand that you can collect the water and then store it and all that. I think there's a lot of ways that we can use nature and learn from nature to do that. The challenge is going to scale. Getting in an urban environment is very hard. For rural, there are opportunities. In the urban where you have you know, 10 million plus three that are outside that don't have the water, it becomes very hard to use those natural things in there, but there are definitely places for it in the, in the rural environments. Next. Next, we have Mario. We have Mario from Texas. Um, yes, good afternoon. I'm very grateful for the presentation. And my question mainly is reserving contaminants within water. Um, I live in an area that shares the border with Mexico. And 20 years ago, we had a lapses of um, anencephaly and hydrocephaly and cerebral palsy due to manufacturer, manufacturers in Mexico contaminating water. However, they figured out that the manufacturers were selling the product directly to the U.S. So do you think that, like, what are your thoughts on these subjects of international trading and how they affect our, our economies? Wow, that's, a, again, a challenging question to answer. So transborder um, water. Um, so pollution is one thing, but my colleague at the World Bank, Winston Yu, always says water is a uniter between countries because it's such a, a, a needed resource in there. So water can be a driver of, of uniting countries together. What you were talking about in the pollution part of it becomes very challenging, especially if there's minimal regulations in one country compared to another country. Um, the economic incentives are such that you go to the uh, lower quality uh, regulations in there, and then that becomes a problem, like you said, in the communities that are affected by it. Um, Tighter enforcement of, of regulations is one thing. Um, trying to make a standardized approach across uh, countries for minimum requirements is one of the things that's doing, but then you have fair wage, you have other issues as well to address. So it's a great question. Sadly, I don't have a bunch of time to do it, but you're on, you're on the right track there. Next. Next is Tara from Texas. 
Hi, Dr. Schwab. Thank you so much for your presentation. I found it to be so informative and engaging. So I wanted to ask you what policy measures can be taken to ensure that the burden of water-related health risks um, is not um, disproportionately borne by minority populations and women? Wow. Um, so there's the short answer is, well, if we set a uniform code where we can set some standards, um, that would be a great way. The problem is, is how do you enforce this universally and how do you make sure that those that are most marginalized are the ones that are protected? And uh, that comes to robust policies that then turn into legislation with a stable government. And so on top of those is this issue that we have. The one thing that we're looking at is going beyond the government sector, right? It's bringing this into the business sector where they have you know, robust workforces that are healthy, they can help drive change. So the idea there is, is that you, you leverage existing economic drivers to try to help drive change, but without a stable government, without stable policies, it becomes very hard to maintain. Uh, we see this in the United States as well as we change through different regu regulatory processes every four to eight years too. So it's not just other, in, other countries. Okay, we have one more, I think. Yep, last question from Alexander in Arizona. Um, hello. So I know that there are other global health experts that will focus on different aspects of global health. And I just want to ask, have you collaborated or worked with um, these other experts uh, to like say, uh, like actually create a change? Because I know some people, like one expert, like uh, they focus on science and political science or how it affects legislation and whatnot. But um, have you worked with um, other global health experts and what is the efficacy of these collaborations? That's a great question. The short answer is yes, because um, I provide, so for everybody who's still on this call, it's the last question. I'm gonna be a little long-winded, but not too, because I have to go too, is that there's something you can think about as you go through your careers, however many, uh, whatever you wanna do, whether you stop at high school, or you move on there. It's, if you become knowledgeable in one area, you become like uh, an expert in, in one area where you have something to offer to others. It becomes easier to collaborate instead of being this renaissance individual that knows a lot of, a lot of things, but not the depth. I was able to do that because I had the focus on environmental engineering, environmental water that not that many people were doing. I thought it was great. It was hard to get funding. But what I've done now is I work with clinicians. I work with Cary Business School. So we work with economic drivers and people in the business. We work with policy people in there together to try to develop approaches that can be held together by an understanding of them so that the naivety, if I'm an engineer and I have a solution, engineers don't think in policy. They don't think in the ways of this. And so bringing the policy people from the beginning of the question is incredibly valuable. Bringing that business perspective from the beginning adds what we call hooks, makes us have a more chance of being able to get funding or disseminate the information. So your great question in there, the short answer is collaborate, but you must be able to provide something. You know, very few groups want just someone that can be a renaissance person across that because they've got their areas. But together, if you can put it together, that's how you can drive change. Thank you so much. And I'm going to last one last thing is that please, if you don't remember anything else, remember to wash your hands. It's very important. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, evening, morning, whatever it may be.